Amen. Thank you, Glenn. Today we want to talk about created for a purpose. God values each of us and created us for a purpose. The passages are from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 10. Jeremiah's ministry lasted about 40 years during the reigns of the last five kings of Judah, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. Josiah was the last righteous king. He was the last good king that they had. And his sons and grandsons after him uh, were not good. Josiah lasted or died in 609 BC and from then until the Babylonian captivity which was in 586 BC the nation of Judah was on a continual spiritual downward spiral King Zedekiah refused Jeremiah's warning and rebelled against Babylon which led to the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. The message this morning that the ministry that Jeremiah had lasted about 40 years or 20 years or no, 40 years. And uh, it was to the nation of Israel, but it was also to the other nations to repent. And we see here that they were on a downward spiral, uh, religiously, spiritually, much like our nation this morning. As we move towards our study today, we need to consider two questions. And be patient with me here because where I'm going with this is talking about when does life begin? created for a purpose. God created each and every one of us for a purpose. He has a plan for our life, and we can find out what that plan is when we turn to him in repentance and ask him into our hearts and uh, lives. At what point does human life truly begin? And when does an embryo or a fetus become a real human being, we're going to see in these passages here this morning that it begins at conception, not at birth. And we'll read here about uh, Jeremiah. Does human life begin at conception or not until birth? The claim that true life and thus value as a human being doesn't begin until birth led to the legislation of abortion in America in 1973 in the Roe uh, versus Wade case. Now during the past 48 years, 64 million unborn babies have died at the hands of their own mothers and medical practitioners who serve them. The innocent die at the whim of and for the convenience of the guilty. Look all through history of the genocide, uh, look at Stalin, how many people he had murdered during his reign in Russia. Hitler and his injustice against the Jews in the prison camps. The murder of innocent people as if they didn't matter. Uh, God says that they do matter. And he tells us that in scripture. Scripture indicates that God imparted life to humans in the womb at conception. For Christians who believe that God's work is in God's word is infallible and reveal his will to us, that settles the issue. God says that life begins at conception, making abortion nothing short of murder. God's people need to know what scripture says about that in, important subject. We can't be, well, I think it says this, or 
Maybe it's that. It's clear right here in Scripture. Jeremiah wrote his book of prophecy about the year 580 B.C., shortly after the fall of Judah and Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. The book covers events leading up to the Babylonian captivity as the prophet called God's people in the kingdom of Judah back to covenant loyalty to Yahweh, their God. But the kings of Judah and their advisors would not listen to the prophet who was persecuted terribly for telling them the truth. Jeremiah's message was very simple. Repent. What is our message today as God's people? Repent. We have the same message in the same way that God provided for Jeremiah and called him to be his prophet. God doesn't call prophets in this day and time, but he calls his children to proclaim the word of God to those that are lost. And that's to be our message, such as Jeremiah's message was to the nation of Israel. Right here again, we talked about, I see you, Ronnie. We talked last week about the gospel message being in every one of these lessons, and we'll see how it is in this one is today, too. Go ahead, Ronnie. We're his children. And once we, once we enter into that relationship with him, then we have that calling on our lives to share the gospel message with those who, who we meet. And all, uh, well, we'll get to it here in just a second before I get to ahead of myself. God would use the Babylonians as an instrument of his wrath against them for their disobedience. The kings and the people did not repent, so God did what he said that he would do. Remember way back in Deuteronomy, God told them that if blessing would be for uh, obedience and disobedience would bring judgment. And God doesn't lie, so he's uh, about to put it on them. This was the darkest period of time for God's people in all of Old Testament history. God had redeemed his people from slavery in Egypt and led them into the promised land almost nine centuries earlier. Now God was reversing this. God's people were being taken out of the promised land and into the land of Babylon as slaves. Nothing could be clearer, be a clearer indication of God's judgment against his people than this event. Now God's judgment is about to come on them. Is that it? That, that the end of it? No, it's not. There's a hope for the future. And Jeremiah preached and prophesied for 40 years that there would be a righteous branch raised up in Israel uh, for the redemption of, of the people. And that was a reference to Jesus Christ. There was hope in being redeemed. The opening verses tell us about Jeremiah the prophet, the man who would deliver this awful message of judgment to his own people. The people must not think that God considered human life to be unimportant. Every human life is significant to him and he wants all people to be in a relationship to him on his terms, not our terms. And that's the, the difference. Let's go ahead and read some verses. And notice here what we're talking about Jeremiah and God gave him a message to the people of Israel. This is God's message to Jeremiah in these verses that we'll study this morning. 
someone like to read? Let's go ahead and just read all the verses. There's two more verses that someone would like to read. And there is the hope that we were talking about there in those last couple of words there that he says. God has a purpose for every life. His call to be a prophet occurred in the 13th year of the reign of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, which was the year 627 B.C. He uh, prophesied to about 587 or 586 B.C. So right there historically tells us of the 40 years. Jeremiah's warnings that God would not spare Judah because the nation broke the covenant went unheeded for the entire 40 years Jeremiah proclaimed God's message to his people. They didn't repent. They, it went unheeded. In 587, the 11th year of Zedekiah, Babylon invaded and defeated Judah, taking the people captive and destroying Jerusalem and the temple. Jo Jeremiah no longer had a, a people to prophesy to at that time. So after finishing this book of prophecy, Jeremiah wrote Lamentations as well, and that was a poetic lament over the holy city's destruction. The word of the Lord came to me. This uh, occurs in several other passages about prophets and indicates what his role was. God's word came to him and he then declared boldly and openly what God's message was to his people. God's message in verse 5 is directed at Jeremiah only. The verse is primarily about God and what he, in his eternal will and wisdom, decided Jeremiah would become. It boggles your mind to think that in eternity past, God knew who you were. He knew when you would live. He knows when you will pass. He knows whether you will answer his call on your life or not. He knows that he has a purpose for each and every one of us. But through sin and disobedience, and we use the example of abortion, often God's will for people's lives is not fulfilled. So it's paramount for us to seek the Lord, turn to him in repentance, enter into that relationship with him so we can find out what God's will and what his purpose is for our life. And how do we do that?
Does anybody have any ideas? Through the reading and studying of God's word, through prayer, through hearing God's word preached, uh, through interaction with brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how we mature and uh, learn maybe what God's will is for us. Does anyone in here know what God's calling is for them? What has God called you to do? Amen. Where it says here too that the word of the Lord came to me, his status as a prophet was never in question in his mind. But what did Jeremiah think? He, he's a young guy. They said that he may have still been a teenager when he was called. What was his initial reaction to God's call for him to be a prophet. Just like Moses. I'm unqualified. I can't speak. I'm a child. A child in this instance here too. There's many different interpretations. You can mean a young child. A baby. Uh, a young person. But you can also refer to somebody that's 40 years old as being a child it, it talks about inexperience and what Jeremiah needed to do and what we need to do is if God has called us to do something or to witness to someone take your focus off your inability and focus on God's strength and provision to enable you to do what he's asked you to do. Jim. Amen. Yes. Amen. Absolutely. We don't want to quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Ronnie.
we shouldn't be afraid. That's right, Ronnie. It tells us here that God told Jeremiah, Thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee, and whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. What did Jesus tell the uh, disciples in Luke in chapter 12, verses 11 and 12? And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what things ye shall answer or what ye shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. The same power of God that was to be present in Jeremiah's prophetic ministry would be present in the apostles as they brought the gospel to the nations. God's spirit is present in us as well and will aid us as we bring the gospel to the world and stand for Christ in our society. It's amazing to go into a group of people or this yesterday taking sandwiches and some things around looking for homeless people and giving that stuff to them never seen these people you wouldn't there, there's no fear in doing that you're kind of apprehensive you think well what in the world would I say to this person and it's amazing what the Holy Spirit will give you to say it, it's to express kindness to them to, to not look at them like it's their fault or where they're at. It's not judging these people, but showing them the love of Christ and reaching out to them and extending to them something that they could use. And not just the material things, but sharing the gospel with them. Asking them what their name is. Uh, I want to know your name so I can pray for you. And, and things like that. Don't... Uh, Turn them away, but embrace them and, and let them see in you the difference that, that Christ has made in you. I know with me, when I started coming to church before I was saved, that's what drew me at the old building was I didn't feel like I was being judged. I felt as if I were accepted by everybody there, and I felt comfortable with that. So that, that's, just want to treat people the way that they treat you. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with thee to deliver thee. Doubt or fear must have been behind the reasons he felt inadequate for his role as God's prophet. Sometimes we can have doubt. We doubt ourselves. We have fear. What will they think? Everybody wants everybody to like them, and we don't want to offend anyone or say the wrong thing. But God will fill our mouth. Jeremiah would be prophesying and proclaiming God's words. God would be present with Jeremiah. God would, will be present with us when we do that, that work as well. We need not fear anyone or anything. For God would be with him to deliver him from whatever situation that he encountered. God was speaking peace to Jeremiah's anxious mind. When we consider that during his prophetic ministry, Jeremiah was imprisoned four or five different times for proclaiming uh, this message. Was God still there to rescue him? He was. But he rescued him in God's time, not in Jeremiah's time. So we see the whole situation is in God's hands. We may go through some things or some suffering for uh, pro proclaiming God's word, but God will deliver us as well when his purpose is, is accomplished. Saith the Lord, 
is the term for Yahweh. It's 176 times in the book of Jeremiah. And it's derived from the word meaning to whisper. And one commentator said, it's like I'm going to let you in on a secret. It's like God speaking to him and say, hey, let me let you in on something here. What, what I'm doing here. These final words from God were a further assurance to Jeremiah that he was indeed the Lord God. It was indeed the Lord God who was speaking to him and that what God had promised Jeremiah he would fulfill. God speaks to us in our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit by all these means and God expects us to listen. The Holy Spirit will never tell us to do anything that contradicts God's revealed word, the Bible. Ronnie. Amen. God equips us with what we need to carry out his purpose. In verse 9 it said, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. How can we get God's word in our mouth? Get in there and study it and read it. Not just read it academically, but allow it to tr transform you as you read it. God's word is alive. And it has the power to, to change us and grow us. Go ahead, Ronnie. What's some of the excuses that we use for not doing God's will in our lives? I'm too busy. I got to be over here. I, I'm already running late. That, that, that could be something too, Ronnie. I'm too lazy. I'm not doing that. I'm not calling them. They haven't been to church for two months. What good's it going to do if I call them? You, can, you can't have that mindset. That, that's not God speaking to you. Uh, in those instances how are we called to tear down and build up in today's culture denounce sin have no part of it and to build up is, is to encourage and to witness to be there for someone I told here a couple weeks ago one of them guys that I work with called me about two weeks ago, and he was crying. And I asked him if everything was okay, and he said that his cousin had cancer. And he asked me if I would pray for him. And he told me, he said, Pete, he said, you were the first person I thought of. And I, I was touched by that and uh, have continued to pray for his cousin. God values each of us and created us for a purpose. God promises his presence to every believer, regardless of the age or season in life. Just as Jeremiah was not to let his age keep him from surrendering to his creator young adults shouldn't wait until they are older to surrender their lives to Jesus Ron
God's grace and mercy over and over and over. We said that in spite of what you do or don't do or choose to do or not do, God's will will not be thwarted. It will be accomplished. Ronnie. God will, God will have mercy on those whosoever he chooses to and some he, he may not and that's a testimony to uh, friends and people that we knew through our experience in life that are no longer with us some were saved some were not and uh, we, we often ask that why question but uh, we can't question in God God's ways are perfect, and uh, we'll understand further along. Amen. That, that's well said, Jim. I can remember, I think, the first time that I had an opportunity or had an understanding about being saved. I was about nine or ten years old. And a friend of mine that I went to school with, they had altar call. And he went forward. And I didn't. And I have often wondered what may have been had I went forward at that time. He's been a Christian all his life. Well, from nine on, and uh, he he's had some things that he's went through. He had quadruple uh, bypass surgery here recently on his heart, and John's faith is still still strong. And I I've talked to him here recently, but uh, we just have to remember that. God knew in the eternity past. That's, there is a peace that you have. I, I know when I had the heart attack and they went back, took me back there to do what they had to do. I was, I was okay. Because I, I remember before they started their procedure that this doctor prayed with his, his team before they started working on me. And I was like, whoo, thank you, Lord, for that. I was uncomfortable laying on that table that's about this wide for a, a good while, but God was with me all through all of that. And the peace that Jim was talking about, I had that peace. I wasn't freaking out because of what they were doing. 
I knew that it was in God's hands. Ronnie. It's the greatest experience of it does. It keeps on getting better and better. I think I have about one minute left. Does anybody have a testimony or anything that they would like to share? How God has blessed them this week? Go ahead, Terry. Praise God, Terry. I thank you once again for your patience with me. And may the Lord watch over you and bless you all this week. Thank you.